Welcome to episode 77 of I Thought I Knew How, a podcast about knitting and life and all sorts. I'm your host, Ann Frost, and this episode was recorded on February 24th, 2022. Today we are going to talk about linen, which is a fiber I think gets overlooked a lot by knitters. Whether that is fair or not, I shall leave up to you, but there is no question that linen has been with us for a long time, and many knitters are a little mystified by it. So let's learn together. I have had a few business owners approach me lately about sponsoring the show. The easiest way I have to manage that is through Patreon. So I have created a new tier there specifically for business owners. If you would like to support the work I'm doing here on the podcast and reach out to my audience, please visit patreon.com slash I thought I knew how and look for the episode sponsor level. If you are interested in becoming a business sponsor, please email me before signing up. I don't work with just anyone. Individuals who would like to support the work I'm doing here on the podcast are also welcome to visit patreon.com slash I thought I knew how and check out the various tiers and rewards that come with them. Many thanks to my current patrons for your ongoing support. So I wanted to do another fiber specific episode today. We have talked about wool a lot in the past and I recently did an episode on silk. I thought it was time to give some love to some of the plant fibers out there. And linen might be my favorite of the plant fibers to work with. Saying that, I may need to clarify. Linen is my favorite plant fiber to have a finished object made out of. As we talk about linen today, you'll hear some downsides to the actual working with it, some of which can be easily mitigated. There is no doubt that a linen face cloth or linen lace curtains or a summery top can all be wonderful things. So it is worth the extra effort, I think. The first time I knit with linen was actually in the Philippines. I love a good thrift store. Charity shops are my jam. There is nothing better than poking through a craft section that hasn't been visited by a fellow crafter for a while and finding all sorts of vintage yarns and books and tools just waiting to come home with me. I have started exercising more restraint in the last few years. I no longer rescue all yarn or needles I see. I just go for things that are truly special for some reason, and the rest I leave for my fellow crafters. I am trying to reform. In This area of the world, with lots of former mills around, it's not uncommon to come across mill ends, even now, decades after most of the mills have closed down. I assume that as they were closing, folks were allowed to bring mill ends home with them, or maybe they were sold locally at a discount, and they ended up in someone's stash and never got used. I was at the point in my fibercraft life where I was transitioning away from big box store acrylics to natural fibers, but I was not able to pay for 100% linen from a yarn store yet. One day while I was in a Goodwill or Salvation Army or something like that, I came across a bag of lace weight linen mill ends. It was all singles on cardboard tubes. Some were more full than others. It was just all in the same natural tan shade, but the entire bag of them was $5. Yes, please, and thank you. Those came home with me without a second thought, and I took them with me to the Philippines because, hey, linen in the tropics is perfect. They sat in my stash for a few years there until we moved from our first rental house into the second one. The second house was odd. It was built in the 80s and looked like it would have been at home in Miami. Flat-roofed, concrete walls, huge floor-to-ceiling windows in some areas of the house, and bedrooms with foot tall windows across the top of one wall, too high to actually see out of. There was not one single 90 degree corner in the entire house. Everything was purposely slightly off kilter. The hallway to our bedrooms was on the second floor with floor to ceiling windows along the entire exterior wall and at the end of the hall. And all of that faced the street, which was fine in the daytime, because a slight tint kept people from being able to see in, but with the lights on inside at night, people could just enjoy a nice view of everyone walking around. (laughs) It was a very odd house that was probably suitable for like a young couple with no kids who like to host house parties. We made it work for a couple of years, but I was very glad to move into a house with square corners again. 
Anyway, back to those bedroom windows I mentioned. If we were early risers, they would have been fine, but we were not early risers. That side of the house had some palm trees that cut back on the amount of sunlight coming in, but not by much. No one in the Philippines was selling foot high curtains, and I didn't want full drapes on 11 to 15 feet of 12 inch windows. My husband and I got the worst of the morning sun, so immediately I sewed us a set of short lined curtains to go across our windows, but I Oh, I hate sewing. I'm sorry. I, I hate sewing so much. I know so many of you listening are also like quilters and sewing. It just does not agree with me. And so I can manage a curtain from time to time, but then I hit my limit really quick. So when it was time to make curtains for the girls' room, I got out my knitting needles and I grabbed the linen and I got to work. I consulted a stitch dictionary and I picked a lace pattern of medium density, I would say. It wasn't too airy but it also wasn't just stockinette with the occasional hole in it. I held the linen triple so it would go quicker and got to work knitting panels that were about two feet wide and a foot high with a pocket at the top for a tension rod to hold them. And they went up as I finished them and I kept knitting them until there were enough panels that the curtains were scrunched up fully enough to dramatically cut back on the light coming through their windows. That project took me a good month, month and a half to finish up. And when the time came to move, you better believe I took those with me. I will likely never live in a house again that has foot tall windows, but I figure I can probably use them as a valance at some point in the future. As I worked on them, it was quite a learning experience. Linen can be very stiff to work with, and it is a very strong fiber. I was back and forth to the internet a lot looking for advice on how to keep myself from literally injuring myself with it. I will share more about that later. I didn't have tons of the linen left when I finished. I knit a few of grandma's best dishcloths with the remainder and using and washing those was how I learned just how magic linen can be once it's been washed a few times. It softens up dramatically. It is brilliant. I have a very little linen left in my stash at the moment. It's just one spool of 330 yards of fingering weight that I found at Lyric Hill Farm, which is not far from where I live. They sell it with instructions for knitting washcloths or scrubbies, which is how I plan to use it. It reintroduced itself to me this year as I was doing my yarn stash de-stash, and I'd like to get it on the needles and knit it up. I think it will be a perfect travel project for a flight later this year. We're going to stop for a song, but when we come back, we'll talk about the history of linen production and how it's processed. This song is Better Than One from Stephen Ferris, another songwriter who brings in singers to sing his songs for him. I wish I knew the singer for this one. She's fantastic. Enjoy this. I'll be back in a moment.
As we are talking about different natural fibers and their histories on the podcast, one thing we need to keep in mind is we really have no idea when people started working with any of them because the use of all of our naturally occurring fibers started long before people began to write. So the burden of deducing when humans came to use certain fibers is largely in the hands of archaeologists making their best guesses. The earliest known instance of flax fibers found in connection with human settlement is from a cave in the Caucasus Mountains dating back 36,000 years ago. They had degraded to powder, so their original form was unknown, but there is evidence that they had been dyed. It's a safe assumption that they had been spun into string. Long before humans were weaving, they were adorning themselves with string dangling from cords worn around their waists. The evidence for this comes from small carvings found in various locations around Europe. It's likely that these early string adornments were made of wool or flax, or both. The first surviving remnant of linen cloth is dated to 7000 BC and was found wrapped around the handle of a tool made from an antler. The cloth was tested and the flax was from a domesticated form, suggesting that humans had been cultivating it for use as cloth for a good amount of time by that point. When you think of all the steps involved in processing flax, it's really quite impressive that it came to be used at all. With wool, it's easy to imagine an ancestor raising sheep for meat, one day turning some shed fiber between their fingers and noticing that it held together and was stronger than when it wasn't twisted. Flax is not so obvious. It's grown in areas of the world that have four distinct seasons, though of course the first flax would have been wild varieties. It's harvested by either pulling the plant up whole or cutting it very close to the ground to maximize the length of the fibers. The plant is soaked to loosen the outer bark of the stalk in a process called redding. The stalks are then crushed by either rolling it or breaking every few inches with the the use of a tool that resembles the old kind of paper cutters. The outer stalk is removed and the inner stalk is run through a hackling comb, which knocks away the last of the outer layer and splits the inner stalk into long, thin strands that really resemble blonde hair. Hence the description of flaxen-haired ladies. It is at this point that the fibers can be spun and then put to use by knitters or weavers. Depending on where in the world it was being used, linen was either used for outerwear or underwear. Linen robes and shirts in warmer climates could be made from thinly spun thread woven loosely and decorated with embroidery or by having items sewn to the surface. Modern people often cringe when they hear about people wearing the same linen shift as underwear for days and days at a time, but linen is moisture wicking and it dries quickly. The length of the fibers makes it strong and unlikely to pill. As I mentioned before, the more it's washed, the softer it gets. And it's naturally antifungal and antibacterial. So combine all of that together and you have a comfortable garment that is less likely to capture and retain odors. In fact, during the long period of time when bathing was sort of out of fashion, people could clean themselves reasonably well by vigorously wiping themselves down with just a piece of dry linen cloth. Linen is fragile before it's spun. It's a plant fiber, so it's prone to breakage, but once it's spun, it's not as likely to break unless it's folded crisply and repeatedly in the same spot. Those who are unfamiliar with linen are sometimes put off by its initial feel when trying it in stores or while touching it in a yarn shop. It can feel very heavy and stiff, but with washing, as I've said, linen softens more and more over time. Fashion-wise, its one real downside is that it loves to wrinkle. Many of you probably are already aware that the hottest setting on your iron is generally marked linen because it can be a lot of work to get those wrinkles back out of the garment. And once it's on your body again and you start wearing it, those wrinkles are going to return. Most designers tend to use linen in looser fitting designs that will both be less conducive to picking up wrinkles and also appear more casual generally so that the wrinkles become sort of part of the look. In ages past, linen fabric with slubs was considered defective. Slubs are thicker areas caused by an uneven number of fibers in the spin, by knots, 
or by areas of the thread that were underspun. Now, slubby linen is often viewed as proof that you are wearing this more expensive fabric. Cotton manufacturers have even started creating slubby cotton on purpose to try to replicate this look of linen. Linen has a long and fascinating economic history that will not fit into a single episode of my humble podcast. One of the sources I used as I researched this topic is a brand new book called Worn, A People's History of Clothing, written by Sophie Thanhauser. It was just published last month by Pantheon Books. The book is divided into five sections covering linen, cotton, silk, synthetics, and wool. Each section covers the history of human interaction with the topic of the chapter, as well as how it affected society and its economic impact. For instance, in the case of linen, Thanhauser covers the linen guilds of 17th century Germany and the conflicts between professional guilds and home producers, including how women were initially allowed into the linen guilds and how they were eventually excluded. Those familiar with the effect of the clearances on wool production may not be surprised to learn that that impacted linen production as well. Warren is proving to be a fascinating read. I'll stick a link in the show notes in case you're interested in picking up a copy and delving deeper. There is still time to be part of Knit New Haven's Yoke Along Sweater Knit Along. Participants receive 15% off when they purchase at least three hanks of yarn for their project. And there are online knit times for help and advice and cheering on. It's too late to qualify for the cast on prize, but there is a finish prize on the line. Learn more at knitnewhaven.com. I mentioned Lyric Hill Farm as the source of my linen earlier. Morehouse Farm is actually partnering with Nancy from Lyric Hill for the upcoming set of classes in the Morehouse Merino Flock Group. Nancy is well known in the area for her goat milk soaps, and she also creates beautiful felted soaps for sale. She will be teaching a felted soap class to the Morehouse Merino Flock Group on Saturday, March 12th at 10 a.m. Eastern and Tuesday, March 15th at 7 p.m. Eastern. You will need to hop over to morehousefarm.com to order a kit for this class as soon as possible so you have it on time and join the Morehouse Merino Flock Group to attend the class and get ongoing support as you complete the project. While you are a member of the flock group, you can check out previous knit-alongs as well as get all the help and instruction that came with those. Visit morehousefarm.com to learn more. All right, so let's talk about linen and fiber arts. Embroiderers and cross-stitchers are familiar with linen as one of their options for the ground for working their stitches. When people are ready to progress past Ada cloth, which has very obvious openings to help make your stitches the proper dimensions, they often upgrade to linen, which still has an obvious weave that can allow thread artists to create even patterns with a little more attention. Linen cloth also provides a more even, uniform look to the areas that have not been worked over with thread. Skipping to the end of the process for those who want to knit and crochet with linen, It is machine washable, though you should respect your work and wash it on the delicate cycle. You can even dry it in a tumble dryer if you like, though I think I'd still be more likely to dry it by hanging or laying it flat just so I know that I'm getting it in the right shape. Linen will hold a block, so it's often used for lace knitting. You can just follow the same procedure for wet blocking wool. Wet it thoroughly, Roll it up in a towel and gently press the excess water out of the piece before pinning it out on a flat surface to open up the lace and leave it until it's totally dry. Working with linen can be very difficult on the hands. And this is what I was referring to in the first segment of the show when I was talking about having to keep yourself from getting injured. (laughs) Some linen yarns will come to you a little softer than others. And I'm guessing... Some yarn makers either give it a wash or two before selling it, or the manufacturing process at particular mills sort of scrunches it up a bit more as it goes through the equipment, so it's already on its way to softness. The few times I've knit with linen, it has started to cut a groove in the skin on my finger that tensions the yarn. Both times I caught it early, and both times I just put a Band-Aid on the affected finger and was able to carry on with no issue. It wouldn't cut through the band-aid like it did my skin, and it provided enough of a barrier that it didn't hurt my skin anymore. However, another solution for this is just to dramatically loosen up your tension as you use it. 
You should, of course, do this as you do your gauge swatch so you have an accurate understanding of what your results will be. I'm not good at maintaining different tensions. I know what is a comfortable tension for me to knit at, and that's how I knit, and I adjust needle sizes accordingly. So for me, I just stick with a Band-Aid when I'm knitting with linen. Another tip I was given long ago by someone who had knit with a lot of linen was to wet the yarn. I have done that in the past, and I found that it did make it less stiff as I knit with it. You don't have to soak the ball. Generally, what I would do would be to get my hand wet and run it along the yarn for a yard or two, and then I would knit that up and then dip my hand in a little bowl of water again and just run it along the yarn. Linen can be very heavy compared to other fibers. For that reason, you will rarely ever see 100% linen in a DK weight or thicker. For clothing, you may want to aim for fingering and lace weight yarns, or look for patterns that incorporate a lot of open work to help reduce the overall weight of the garment. Linen will often be blended with other fibers to lighten it up and add the other characteristics from the other fiber. A linen wool blend, for instance, will be warmer and lighter than a pure linen. Uh, Linen also adds stability when blended with alpaca, and I think I've mentioned before on the podcast, one of the downsides of alpaca is that it continues to stretch over time. Linen will help counteract that. Linen is also very inelastic. So it is best to avoid patterns that do better with some flexibility, like cabling and tighter styles, because they might just feel very restrictive. It's great for household goods. Linen face cloths and dish cloths will last ages, and as I said, they get softer over time. I don't know if I've mentioned... (laughs) I don't know if I've mentioned 17 times yet that linen gets softer over time, but it really does. It's amazing. It's great for decorative lampshades and doilies and curtains as well as placemats and tablecloths and other household goods you might be tempted to knit. Historically, linen socks knit to a very fine gauge were worn by as many people as could afford them. Their natural antibacterial, antifungal nature make linen perfect for feet. However, as I mentioned, linen is very inelastic, so the socks had to be worn with gaiters to keep them in place. Linen will weaken when exposed to direct sunlight, so if you do want to knit curtains, best stick them on the shady side of the house. Otherwise, linen is very strong, some 30% stronger than cotton, and it gets even stronger when it's wet. Linen takes dye very well, which is a blessing and a curse. You can find a wide range of colors to work with, but it also stains very easily, so you may want to consider that when you're thinking about whether to use it on your table if you want to do some housewares. Maybe if you're going to do placemats, save them for best when everyone's going to have their proper table manners. Otherwise, just take care when eating while you're wearing your new creation. For those who avoid cotton because of its questionable environmental impact, you might be happy to hear that it requires one quarter of the water that cotton does and one seventh the amount of chemicals as it's growing. Additionally, there are uses for every part of the plant, so none of it is being burned or sent to landfills. Linen used to only be processed in areas close to where it is grown, but now it is sometimes sent farther afield to take advantage of less expensive labor in Eastern Europe or China. If processing miles are a concern to you, look for products made in Western European countries and the Baltic states. Northern Italy, Belgium, Ireland, and France are all well known for their high quality flax production. Okay folks, that is where we're going to leave our learning about linen. As I mentioned earlier, there is a lot about the history of linen that I was not able to touch on. While silk was difficult to find sources for, there are quite a few books out there dealing with linen and I encourage you to definitely check out Worn and poke around on Amazon some more to find some other titles. Whether you decide to actually buy them from Amazon or check them out of your library, that's up to you, but that's a good place to go looking for some books. One more song before we wrap things up. This is Tom Goldstein with Far Away.
think of you Who'll always be there A few more things before I go. The Knit Along for the Hap Shawl designed by Ella Gordon begins on March 1st. I am really happy with this one. I'm actually going to end up knitting two. I started with one idea for colors, did a swatch, didn't love it, went a totally different direction with my colors. I had to start knitting already because I'm co-hosting this Knit Along with Jana of the Pearl Together podcast and we have to film the videos ahead of time so they can be edited for the Knit Along. And as I was knitting my plan B colors, I decided, hey, I really do like my plan A colors after all. So when the cast on comes along on March 1st, I'm going to cast on again in my original colors. I'm going to keep one and gift the other when Christmas rolls around. And that way, I will also be able to feel ever so proud of myself for continuing to get some Christmas knitting done well in advance this year. I am using traditional Shetland yarn for both of mine. They're both being knit in Uradale Farm jumper weight, which is equivalent weight to what the pattern calls for. I don't know of any stockists in the U.S. who currently have it in stock, but if you want to order it directly from Uradale, it will very likely be to you a little late for the kickoff, but not so late that you can't catch up. We are, however, encouraging people to knit from stash for this project, so poke around and see what you have. Jana is knitting using merino sock yarns, which behave differently from the Shetland wool in the design. But in the swatching video that will go live on March 1st, Jana talks about how she modified her version accordingly. So poke around, see what you have already, buy what you need to fill in gaps if you need to, and join us on the Pearl Together channel and Ravelry group and on the I Thought I Knew How Facebook group and Instagram. We will be offering prizes. Learn more about those on the Pearl Together Ravelry group. Secondly, just a quick reminder to check in on your local library and recreation departments and see what offerings they have for crafters to gather and socialize. I will be attending a monthly fiber craft group at my local library starting in April, and various towns around me offer adult education classes, some of which include topics like needle felting and technique-specific knitting classes. We all think about our local yarn stores as a source for classes, but do a bit of research on what the larger community is offering and you might be surprised. Or maybe you'll be inspired to fill a gap in your local community and offer some classes yourself. Just something to chew on. I'll be back in a couple of weeks with more fiber goodness for you. In the meantime, thank you for listening and knitting with me for a bit. If you'd like to support the show, please visit patreon.com slash I thought I knew how to make a monthly pledge. You may also consider making a purchase from one of our sponsors by visiting the website I thought I knew how.com and clicking the link at the top that says be a booster. While you are on the site, you can also find the show notes for each episode. Thank you ever so much to my patrons, to Knit New Haven, and to Morehouse Farm for sponsoring the podcast. Find me on my social media accounts as I thought I knew how, except on Twitter, where it's just thought I knew how. The groups on various platforms are all called I Thought I Knew How Podcast. Until next time, may you be blessed with stitches that never drop, yarn without joins, and plenty of time to knit. Knit. <laughs>